Um, George, I was going to give you a three, two, one, wasn't I? Oh, sorry. Wait until, <laughs> wait welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to the Changing Campus. It's our fourth um, event in this series. Um, in case no one's noticed, Luke has been extremely busy and productive this year um, with about seven events. And I'll, I'll, for those people who haven't joined us through those, I'll give us a very quick um, taste of what those are. Um, so I'm Becky, I'm from Art and Design. Um, I am a kind of um, space and place group fan, hanger on, uh, partner in, in crime sometimes, and um, where I can, I um, step in and give Luke a hand. Um, so today's session, oh, hang on. So today's session, we're delighted to have uh, Terry Lisa Griffiths here and Jill D Dickinson, um, ex Hallam, um, now University of Leeds, um, Vicky Mellon from Tourism at Hallam, and Julian Dobson from Crazer and Shoe. So briefly, um, to set set the scene, so you know what on earth you've come to, um, Space and Place Group, venerable old. Uh, organization, Luke's been running it for many years. Um, one of my favorite things about Hallam, um, it's managed to avoid being um, uh, a, a, um, an institutionally sanctioned cluster and managed to keep a really fleet of foot and interest led uh, discursive group about space and place. Um, I have met all sorts of people at the space and place group from all corners of the university um, it's always a delight and a surprise to see who, who you meet there discussing all sorts of topics in relation to space and place. Um, the Higher Education Research Cluster, um, slightly less old cluster, but um, and Terry Lisa and Jill are um, leading this cluster designed to um, explore all the higher education research that happens at Hallam and draw it together and generate debate. I've, I've put a little bit of a screen grab image hanging there on, on, on Luke's well put together tidy, tidy slides of, the, of the, the first rubbish screen grab image of a university that I found online. Uh, it's clearly a sort of American university. Um, um, I don't like screen grabs very much, I find them quite, but I find them quite amusing uh, for what they tell us about what, we're, what that thing is supposed to be. Um, but the, the Space and Place Group and the Higher Education Research Cluster came together with a joint interest in the reality of universities and the ways that university as a space and a place and a material reality relates to the learning that happens there. Um, uh, so it was a, a really interesting, um, it's been a very interesting kind of an unexpected partnership. So over this year, um, these are the kind of events that I've run. We, there's been a series of events called Changing Places, which has been specifically looking at spaces under construction. Um, uh, it's all archived online, um, not universities, but places for all sorts of reasons um, in different stages of process. And then the Changing Campus has specifically been about Hallam Campus um, and its you know, immense changes, both uh, educational values, uh, ambitions and material realities and changing education. Uh, as I've put some other images up there. One of my uh, favorite images of Hallam that says, hello future um, in very 1960s writing, which always amuses me quite a lot. And, and then on the right is a a picture of um, of um, the science park. Um, every time I walk past the science park, I grab a little bit of the rubble from under the gate. Um, it's probably radioactive or something. But this idea that um, the science park has been reduced to this sort of substance and then it's been rebuilt on top of it fascinates me. So I, I've put those sort of three images in as a sort of reminder about all the ways that university ambition and desire and what we expect of ambition, reality, and material stuff all interact in all sorts of places, but particularly um, 
the way it interacts in the university is of interest here. Um, so briefly, I wasn't at some of these, so I'm not going to say much about them for fear of getting it wrong. But our, our first session uh, was on changing places and identities. Our second session on change and the material fate, fate of place. I really recommend you listen to those, these. They're really, some of them really interesting. And then the changing campus, which this is a part of the series. Um, oh, hang on. Turn off, please. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, daughter skiving and come home early. Um, shh. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, changing campus. These were the first, the first speakers in the first event. Um, really interesting discussion, uh, drawing on all sorts of research from different universities, uh, the perspective of different groups of people within the university. And also, interestingly, lots of different methods. And I know the higher education research cluster are particularly interested in broadening out and celebrating the range of um, the range of methods and the interdisciplinary meeting of methods that happens within higher education research. So that, that session really reflected that. Uh, second session, uh, uh, fantastic session from Haral Patel, looking at um, the development of a library um, and its material, social, cultural, political, um, uh, bringing into being um, James Carazzo and Leila Garib, who are from um, Hallam, uh, looking at furniture and uh, the ways that furniture helps with the disciplining of teaching, how, how the use of furniture and um, particularly a sofa in design could be seen as part of the, the learning of the kind of culture, learning the culture or the disciplining of what it is to become a designer. And Justine Pedler looking at um, uh, learning spaces um, and a Hallam project about future spaces. These two sessions I was not at, I can't remember them as well, but um, Carol Taylor, um, and many of you may know, um, all these are really interesting. So please do go and have a look. So that brings me on to today. Um, so we have Terry Lisa Griffiths and Jill, and I'm going to hand over to you uh, as. I am not all that good at doing introductions. Please do do a brief one before you start. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. I'm just gonna uh, stop sharing. Yeah. Hang on. Right, I'll just uh, slides ready. So hopefully you can see the full screen. Yeah. Perfect. Lovely. Um, thanks, Becky. Um, so, yeah, my name is Terry Lisa Griffiths and I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Law and Criminology here at Sheffield Hallam. Jill, do you just want to introduce yourself? Before I give you yes, absolutely. Um, so it's lovely to be returning to Hallam virtually today. Um, and I'm Jill Dickinson and I'm an associate professor in law with the School of Law at the University of Leeds. Thanks, Jill. So um, we had quite a long uh, piece of a quote from our data um, when we were advertising this talk and we took it off the slide because it was quite long. Uh, but I am going to read out for you just because I feel like it gives a really nice flavour of what it is that we want to talk about today. And the quote is this. I'm in a lecture hall with chairs and a big screen and someone talking. It felt special in a way to me. It felt like all my hard work had come to something. So today we're going to talk to you about the case study that we undertook during the pandemic year, which is what I'm calling it now, uh, the academic year where uh, we were all involved in remote uh, teaching and students were experiencing remote learning. So we're going to give you a background to the context of that case study and we're going to give you some information about our methodology but what we really want to talk to you today about is our findings 
Uh, and we've got three themes that we're going to explore with you uh, and then we're going to have an opportunity hopefully to discuss those with you uh, and think about what they mean to the future of higher education. Jill and I were reflecting the other day that sometimes we feel that there's a rush to forget what happened uh, during the remote delivery and that might just be an element of human nature when things and we're struggling with things we want to move on and forget about those uh, experiences but we think it's really important to actually reflect on this and think about what these uh, the implications of uh, the findings from our study might mean uh, for the future. Thank you, Terry Lisa. And um, so, yeah, we thought it'd be good to start off with a little bit of context. So, the case study it's one of the UK's largest universities, over thirty thousand students. And I think it's important to note that many of its students are local. Uh, they've got links with the uh, university outside of their university experience. 97% are from state schools or colleges. Um, we've got 23% from low participation neighbourhoods, which is considerably higher than the national average of 12%. And the institution's strategic focus is very much on applied learning across all of its programmes. Um, as with many institutions, a state's investment is central um, to the uh, case studies marketing strategy. And again, as with many institutions, uh, this institution took a blended approach to learning during the academic year 2020 to 2021, but is returning or planning for return to normal from September. Thanks, Teresa. Okay, so um, we've got this video embedded here that I'm just gonna show you part of, um, just because we feel that this example, which is taken from Sheffield Hallam, uh, illustrates this uh, concept that we're trying to uh, sort of uh, give in terms of the context of the study about the marketization of the campus uh, and how campus spaces are perceived as being really central to the student experience. of Sheffield Hallam's Collegiate Campus, which is just a 10 minute trip from the city centre. Right now we're outside the heart of the campus building, which is the central point for all of Collegiate Campus. In here, you've got space to meet people, do your work and just take a break between lessons. At the bottom, we have the Granary Cafe, which a lot of people say is their favourite place to eat on campus. So it's well worth checking out. We also have our student services centre here, which can give you advice and support on everything from careers to finance, study skills and well-being. So help us right here when you need it. This area is also home to subjects like psychology and law, and we've even got our own mock courtroom for the students practising. OK, I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, I think that pretty much illustrates the point that I wanted to make with that video and um, a really kind of friendly approach, lots of sunny images. Uh, typically, these kinds of campus tours are given by students as well. Uh, so it's really trying to give that kind of welcoming vibe. And you can see as well that, you know, lots of students around seem to be using the spaces. Um, so that is. Hi, I'm Ella site. and today I'm giving you a quick tour. There we go. So um, basically, um, the, when we completed the case study, uh, what we felt was that happily, we had uh, lots of really rich data to look at. So uh, we took the decision to analyze the data using a specific conceptual framework. Uh, and the framework that we uh, utilized was that of sociomateriality. And I've just got a few points here from um, Rene Acton's work um, from 2017, because um, Acton um, what, um, completed a study which was based in a kind of university context. Uh, so Acton um, posits that considering space, people and practice together can help us support a goal of collaborative and active pedagogies within the university concepts or context. Um, and uh, when we're looking more traditionally at educational spaces, the reason why sociomateriality is promoted by Acton is that it considers the agency of the people who use the spaces. So effectively um, spaces are in a constant state of becoming and that cannot be separated from the social actors within those spaces. 
So I've just got this quote here from Acton space and its use, benefits, purpose and effects are formed through interaction with living and non-living entities. So in terms of advocating for a socio-material perspective, um, it's trying to explore pedagogical practice and spatialized expressions of power in education. And this picture we chose purposefully because it's a space in collegiate campus. And again, it's just an example of these kinds of um, spaces which are created or designed with specific things in mind. So uh, this is the moot court uh, and it is within the Department of Law and Criminology. And it's obviously used a lot by our law students. And yeah, just on that, so this is a, an image from one of the mooting competitions um, that, that are held. And um, we just thought it was a, a great example of how when the students put on their gowns and um, you know they, they act out mock courtroom experiences in front of a judge in this dedicated type of learning space, it really can help to support the development of their identity um, as law students. Thanks, Terry Lisa. Yeah, so just to finish uh, with this slide here, uh, our question for this uh, case study uh, was basically what happens to student identity and becoming when learning spaces are transposed to living spaces? Thank you. So yeah, in terms of um, the approach that we took then, so you can see there our aim um, for the research was to explore how actual, it was staff and students learning space has changed during the pandemic, but for this presentation we're very much focusing on the student experience. Um, so this was a longitudinal case study. We felt that it was important to examine um, perceptions of changing learning spaces over a period of time. Um, it was conducted over the academic year 2020 to 2021. We've got 18 participants um, and it was great that they were from across the institution in you know, lots of different courses. And we adopted a, a qualitative approach and drew on creative methods um, to encourage participants' reflection. So I'll just hand over to Terry Lisa to tell you a little bit more about what we did. Thank you. Yeah, so um, the creative methodology that we used was uh, participant generated images. So we asked participants to submit an image of their learning space, their current learning space. Um, and the purpose of asking student participants to do this was to promote reflection, as Jill has mentioned. So we also asked them to give us some of the wider context. So, for example, were they at home or in shared accommodation or perhaps in student halls of residence? And then how that context impacted on their experience of remote learning. Um, so using the images was designed to support reflection and it did do it really nicely and um, it was very effective uh, in the focus groups to help students with uh, student participants with their reflection uh, and perhaps it was something that you know would have been more necessary because we were doing the research in a remote environment as well uh, it could have been different in person perhaps um, but there were also some unintended benefits as well uh, so uh, student participants often felt um, when they had like uh, similar uh, setups as other students, they were really positive and happy to see that. Um, and it helped them, they said, to feel like, you know, they weren't the only one uh, in the situation. So uh, really nice to kind of uh, help students who possibly were feeling quite isolated to feel a sense of togetherness as well, which is a really nice and intended benefit of use, utilizing this particular methodology. So um, this, we've labeled this as an activity, but we want to also um, bear in mind and, and keep to time as well. So uh, what we've got here are more kind of food for thought, questions for reflection as we go through. Um, so just these questions on the slide here, um, think about these as we're going through and telling you some of the experiences of uh, our student participants. So we're going to go through now and look at three themes. I'll, I'll just let you have a look at these questions while I'm talking. Uh, and the themes that we're going to explore are um, how online or remote delivery impacted on teaching and learning experiences, 
We're going to look at community participation, and we're also going to examine power dynamics as well. And we're going to give you a brief introduction to each of these three themes to uh, illustrate to you uh, why we chose uh, this particular theme to examine uh, by uh, looking at the literature, existing literature on uh, understanding uh, socio materiality. Thank you, Terry Lisa. Um, so yeah, it goes without saying, doesn't it? The pandemic restrictions really necessitated the move to online teaching and learning. And previously, uh, mainstream online provision in higher education was or tended to be provided by specialist providers. Um, so looking at some of the literature then, um, you know, even before the pandemic, there were challenges around online delivery. So in 2017, we've got Cabricci there um, with others doing a literature review and finding issues around students' expectations. So in an online environment, students, um, they found, you know, assume that tutors are going to be instantly available and how there was a real need to manage um, those expectations through communication, both from the outset setting sort of ground rules and during the course. They also looked at students' readiness for online learning and obviously different learning styles and preferences and whether or not the students necessarily had the skills to be able to fully participate in online courses. And relating to that, um, Hong et al um, looked at five major readiness dim dimensions for students that they needed to be able to successfully engage online. And they suggested that students need to engage in self-directed learning, so they take more responsibility um, for their learning within this more autonomous and flexible environment, identifying their own needs, setting their own goals and implementing action plans. They talked about the need for students to be self-motivated towards their studies so they could see a really clear links between what they were doing and their goals. They also discussed developing computer and internet self-efficacy to help ensure that the students felt confident about using the technology. Um, they discussed developing online communication self-efficacy so students felt that they could meaningly uh, participate within the online environment. And they also discussed the need for students to have a learner control um, in terms of how much they felt able that they could direct their own studies within an online environment. And moving on, Cabrici et al also identified changes, uh, challenges sorry, around student identity and the real importance, and this is something that came through the research, um, of student interaction with both lecturers and peers for mitigating feelings of isolation and disconnection that they might feel uh, from being in an online environment. And then finally, they refer to previous research around online delivery and student participation. And it suggests that up to three quarters of a student's time in this pre-pandemic online environment will be spent in a potentially really passive way, just watching and learning, uh, watching and listening to materials presented on screen rather than having opportunities to more actively engage. Thanks, Teresa. So yeah, in terms of our findings then, um, it's, uh, yeah, th there's all sorts, we've got lots of data around this, but just picking out a few points. Um, so first of all then, talking about how teaching style influenced motivation. So you can see there, um, the quote on the right hand side, um, I'll just let you have a look at that. So essentially, the data that we collected revealed the great lengths that some tutors had gone to, um, you know, to make up learning packs for their students and then actually traveling out to deliver those packs off at students' houses. And the reason for that, they were obviously wanting to try and create as interactive a session as they could, albeit within the restrictions presented by the, on, um, the online environment. And we think that that's really important in terms of socio-materiality. But we also, as we were talking about this, we wonder whether, obviously this has been done with the very best of intentions to recreate that interactive element, but we wonder about staff turning up at students' homes in that way, and does that present something around blurred boundaries between learning and teaching and personal home spaces? Could it be perceived as a bridge too far? And it'd be great to hear your thoughts on that, and perhaps it's something we can return to in the discussion. 
The second point there is around teaching structure and communication and connected to that, the importance of standalone opportunities for students to engage with lecturers. So that second quote on the screen is, is something that a lot of students talked about. They really missed the opportunities they previously had to engage with lecturers, you know, just staying behind for five minutes after a lecture to ask a query or walking with a lecturer to the next session, just asking these inf informal questions. Um, and that last part of the quote I thought was very interesting because it also suggests that students really appreciate how much impact the transition to this online learning and teaching space might have impacted lecturers too. And then connected with that, the next thing to flag is how students might have tried to adapt to the online environment. So some students were telling us that they felt like they were constantly sending emails to their lecturers because that was their main method of communication. And because of that, they then felt that they had to prioritise what queries they were raising rather than just querying small things. Um, another participant suggested that this sudden move from the on campus to the um, online environment made them think about how much more collegial it was when they were working on campus with their lecturer and other students rather than having to work much more independently in the online setting and it really affected their motivation. Thanks Teresa. And then this next slide, um, so very much, and I'll let you just read the quote actually at the bottom if that's okay. So I thought that this quote nicely summed up um, what a lot of the students were saying to us. So they were suggesting here that what they thought was needed was a shift in mindset and an opening up of perceptions around both where and how learning and teaching takes place. So, you know, just because we've always done something in a particular way doesn't necessarily mean to say that other ways might not work. And there's a real sense of a need to focus on maybe the people involved in teaching and learning you know, the staff and the students, not necessarily so much the setting always. And potentially as we move back to this um, physical environment and we're trying out new ways of working, is there an opportunity here to see what works, to share experiences and build those ex elements into future plans? So if I hand over to Sarah Lisa now to talk about some of the findings relating to the second theme of community participation. Thanks, Jill. OK, so um, in terms of the theme of community participation, then, uh, as we've already mentioned uh, and as we already know, um, this new online teaching and learning community uh, was necess necessitated by pandemic restrictions. Um, and previous to that, I think it's probably fair to say, although some courses will have obviously different experiences of this, uh, for the majority of courses, um, previous online learning spaces will have been just the VLE environments. So here at Hallam, for example, we have Blackboard uh, and prior to um, the 2021 academic year, that would have mainly been the way that you would utilize any kind of online space. So obviously existing students are gonna have these ex uh, concepts around uh, online spaces that might have been formed by their interaction or not in some cases uh, with the VLE. Um, and in terms of thinking about online communities within a social material framework, um, I've kind of uh, mapped across some of the findings here from this Harris and Abdin uh, study about online communities. Um, basically, they found that uh, participation in online communities uh, was higher when there was a, a unified feeling and that was often uh, related to common interest. Um, so, for instance, um, students uh, uh, taking part in a group work activity may uh, be seen to have a common interest, which might motivate their uh, participation in uh, online teaching. And uh, conflicts in online communities arise when uh, participant needs aren't met. Uh, so we can think about how students may have self-selected out of um, online activities. Uh, and it wasn't always easy as uh, educators to work out why uh, or understand why their needs in the online space may not have been met. 
relates to that, it's thinking about how quickly we had to make the transition. Uh, and uh, in the other, we're not here to talk about the staff findings in the other side of the study that we did where we looked at uh, staff experiences. Uh, there was a lot of discomfort uh, and a lot of feeling that actually really experienced educators were feeling that they were kind of going back to the start um, and not, not finding the benefit of their experience in the online environment. So um, basically, um, because we went so quickly into this online environment, you have this situation where there are no norms that exist around uh, participation. And so you have this constant development uh, between the social and the material. So for instance, um, students, uh, there basically was an emergence of this kind of cameras off norm. And the student participants in this study uh, reported how um, they were their actions in that regard were often dictated by their fellow students. You know, we heard a lot of, well, I don't want to be the only one with my camera on, uh, so I just turn mine off because everyone else does. Um, so in terms of uh, kind of motivation outside of the space of the online delivery, so students were um, attending their lectures or seminars online, and then they would be expected to engage in the usual kind of self-motivated, self-directed study that we would expect in the offline environment. Um, and we can say uh, from uh, the study here that the experiences of online learning will have dictated how motivated students felt towards their studies. Um, some students who had positive experiences found that they were more motivated to continue working after having their online uh, activities and then other students would report turning off their cameras and mics and doing other things while they were listening to a lecture. Uh, on that note related to it, um, and this is related as well to the next scene, which does tie together, there is some overlap between community participation and power dynamics, which we're going to talk about later. Um, we can say that the usual power relationships that may exist in an on-campus environment where we can probably say that students may feel that they're coming into the space that belongs to the lecturer. Uh, those kinds of power relationships were disrupted and students demonstrated that they were able to exercise much more power around their participation in the online learning environment. And I'm gonna show you, talk to you about some examples um, of where those uh, things were evident within the data. So um, in terms of um, peer engagement and interaction then, which was a sub-theme of community participation, there was a lot of a high report of students feeling the loss of peer support, and that took many uh, forms. So it wasn't just in the classroom. Uh, Jill mentioned before that student participants missed being able to speak to their lecturers uh, in a kind of casual way, a quick way, can I ask you a quick question? Similar feelings for the peer support as well. They weren't in an environment with their peers where they could get the support uh, in a really non-formal or non-structured way. The students who did manage to maintain an element of peer support were those who'd kind of been able to keep in touch. They had kind of group chats on WhatsApp or some of them also arranged kind of zoom talks with their peers as well um, but obviously for participants who were just starting their studies first year undergraduate students or new postgraduate students uh, they were unable to make their um their kind of networks that they would need to help with the success of their studies um, in terms of seminars, um, one of the cornerstones of the seminar activity is obviously group discussion. Uh, and uh, that was basically heavily criticized by students because there was this kind of uh, exercise of uh, agency from other students where they just kind of leave, turn off the cameras, turn off the microphones, not engage in the discussion at all, um, leaving students kind of at a loss as to how they were to engage with their fellow students. Um, 
The other side of it was, and maybe more of a positive element of this, was that students, and it's illustrated by the quote that we've picked out here, students may have actually felt more ownership of learning spaces. So I think this quote is really nice uh, about a lecturer having technical issues. I'll just let you have a read of that. So there was this kind of unintentional, uh, related to technical issues, uh, unintentional opportunity where students had a chance to speak to each other in an informal way that they might have had in the classroom. But what's really interesting about this quote uh, is that the participant compares it to what they would have done last semester. We would have just kind of all sat there waiting like, oh, shall we go or shall we stay? That uncertainty of well, we're in the classroom and this is the lecturer's space and we need direction about what we need to do next. Uh, that didn't happen. In fact, one of the more confident students said that they'd teach the class instead. So this kind of idea that in the online space, it's not necessarily the lecturer's space, and um, the students were kind of claiming some ownership over that space as well. And then the last slide on this theme, um, is this idea that students felt that they were kind of stuck in time and um, particularly first year students you can imagine they finished their a-levels and um, some of them were going into student halls so they had that transition but we also had participants who were still at home uh, so that potentially highlighted that feeling that i've not moved forward in any way um, and we've got some quotes to kind of illustrate these ideas here. So um, some of the uh, students were basically kind of saw this academic year as sort of a way to kind of get through. Uh, and although they may have had interest in engaging with extracurricular activities and going to different societies and getting involved in the wider student experience, um, they just didn't feel that there was any point. Uh, which is kind of sad um, when you think that there was a lot of adaptation uh, if to the online environment. I know that the Students' Union worked really hard to kind of translate some of those things into the online environment, but from what we got from participants, um, they were just tired of the online environment and they wanted to kind of, yeah, get through was the feeling. This can have an impact on the way that they feel about their student identity. Uh, if your identity as a student is tied to these campus spaces, going into a lecture theatre, listening to a lecturer speak, having that interaction with lecturers, then you feel that your identity as a student is perhaps held back. The other element that came through with community participation, um, and it's relevant in terms of the case study institution, as Jill mentioned earlier, with the kind of uh, the makeup of the student population in terms of low participation neighborhoods uh, and socioeconomic background, that they often had different um, responsibilities. And that's the case whether we're on campus or not. Um, but uh, there were some reports from participants that actually uh, their external responsibilities were impacting on their motivation uh, and making it much harder for them to engage in online teaching. Uh, this quote here from this participant, they had said that they'd gone from being a student who did not miss anything. And we all know those students, they come to every session uh, and they felt that the online sessions were much more missable. Okay, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the power dynamics theme. As I mentioned, it does have some connections to community participation, but here uh, we are thinking around more specifically around how people, social groups within university spaces utilize the space and also feel a sense of belonging. Um, so students were learning from home or within student accommodation. Um, and we can say that 
they were kind of in their living spaces and trying to also learn so that they were then forced to make adaptions to their living spaces in order to encapsulate the activity of learning which they were required to do. Um, and the study here by Shang suggests that university spaces have culturally sanctioned forms of civility designed in, and these were arguably absent uh, in the spaces of remote delivery in these online spaces. We don't have social rules, we do not have social norms that we can fall back on. So a great example thinking about this kind of culturally sanctioned civility uh, is the lecture theatre. If we think about the lecture theatre as a space of universal cultural understanding, so nobody needs to be told how to use a lecture theatre. Uh, it's designed so that everyone's facing the lecturer and it's got this panoptic element where the lecturer can also see all of the students as well. And um, everyone has expectations uh, of civility, which can sometimes be in conflict. So the lecturer expects students to focus and not to distract the other learners when the lecture is in session. And the students also expect some level of performance from their lecturer as well to hold their interest. And university leaders and estate teams set expectations about what kinds of teaching will happen within the university spaces by dictating the number and the size of lecture spaces within buildings as well. Um, something to kind of share with you on that is that um, we moved into a new building a few years back and within a couple of years, the recruitment on our courses rendered the designed lecture theatre as too small for the number of students we had on our course. So it just shows you that um, designers, estates teams can uh, actually influence kind of the way that teaching happens and expectations around those as well. So in this theme, we're also going to be thinking about the degree to which actors are able to exercise their agency within the spaces for learning as well. So over to Jill. Thank you, Terry Lisa. Yeah, so in terms of the findings, again, just to give you a bit of a flavour, um, so some of what the participants told us challenged assumptions that students are experienced with and feel comfortable with communicating on suggests how this participant's first ever experience of being in an online call was in their first class of the new academic year. So not only are they having to get back into studying um, again, they're also having to navigate a completely different environment from ones that they'd previously been used to, and that's whether in terms of studying or in their personal life. Um, and then the second quote there came from one of the most interesting focus groups I thought that we had. Um, it, indicates how some students have really struggled during the pandemic to access appropriate learning spaces and um, the students here were both working from their beds so in this focus group they're each sharing their photographs and the, i think it's fair to say terry lisa they both say, seemed really delighted to find that they were talking to somebody else who also worked in a same sort of environment so you can see from the quote they had come across others before but mentioned how they felt they were very much in a minority and they seemed to have a real awareness of how much other students had access to a more traditional desk space and dedicated space to work from and it was interesting because they also shared ideas um, for how they work from their bed and so one pointed to a lap tray that they had and started making recommendations about where they bought it to the other. Um, so yeah, it was kind of good from a sort of networking point of view as well. Thanks, Terry Lisa. And then, yeah, on this slide, um, we've picked out a few more quotes to share with you. Um, the first one connects with that last point around access to appropriate learning spaces. Um, so in this focus group, the participant told us how they lived with their partner and how they very much had to work around each other's commitments in terms of the learning spaces that were available to them. And they both had access to one room that had a table and chairs in it. So sometimes there were occasions when the other would have to resort to using the bathroom to work from uh, just so that they could find that private space. And then the final quote um, around power dynamics that we've picked out broadens the discussion out a bit 
So this participant talks about their perception of university um, and this kind of relates to what Terry Lisa was talking about earlier in terms of community as well. Their perception was that university was a halfway house or a stepping stone that fill the gap between A-levels and seeking employment in what was a very uncertain environment. So they mentioned how lockdown had really limited their employment options. So they felt all they could really do was sit at home and read books. And then they thought, well, actually, this is something I'd be doing, you know, if I took a degree course. So almost they felt like university was an obvious choice in the circumstances that they faced. Thanks, Terry Lisa. Okay, so um, we have shared some of the key concepts from the findings there around student experiences uh, in different learning spaces uh, necessitated by the remote learning that we had to do during the pandemic. The question that we now want you to really think about and we hope we'll be able to discuss together is what we can learn from this uh, as we move back into the physical on-campus environment and as I said we have noted that perhaps related to some of the context we looked at earlier uh, with that campus tour marketized uh, space that whether the kind of return the, the swift return is always being motivated by uh, kind of pedagogical and student experience concerns as it claims to be. Uh, so with that caveat, <laughs> uh, I would, yeah, like, we'd like to invite you to discuss and ask questions about our research. Thank you. Thank you. And very much in, in the chat as well. I'll keep an eye on there. For you. Thank you. Um, Becky, would you like us to kind of stop sharing the slides or would you want, want to keep Yeah, I, I am a little bit mindful of time. Um, I, I think we were aiming for no session to be including questions to be longer than 40 minutes. But I'm, um, Luke and I have been batting around a bit of a conversation about rolling all the questions to the end. But then I, um, you know, I don't want to lose the momentum. So maybe we could have, a, I'm sorry to curtail slightly, but a, a, a much shorter set of questions and then and then roll some over to the end, if that's OK with you, just because I don't want... Um, uh, Vicky and Julian at the end feel like crammed. That's absolutely fine. Yeah, no problem. Sure party, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> and I've put a, a couple of observations in the chat um, um, that actually um, there was a thing about not knowing how to orchestrate the um, the online space and in PGR we, we did it almost ridiculously to to the letter exactly like face to face so particularly for like a PhD viva we almost lit we use the the breakout room to literally move people back and forward and you know we had a buddy to go out with the person and actually I mean it worked very well but it was almost overly it was almost ridiculously complicated because we were mimicking the face-to-face -face because it just doesn't work as easily online. So, well, so that thing about civility, uh, that used a brilliant phrase, uh, I can't remember what it was, um, you know, orchestrated, agreed, permissive, like uh, socially agreed civility, um, how much that relates to space, but with, with the viva of, of almost recreating that space exactly it was almost a bit too much yeah absolutely and, and again driven by kind of uh, questions about you know student experience and I think that um, there are elements of the online delivery which can continue to work well so you know we talked about things like um we thought about things like the cost of living crisis and about asking students to travel to campus for very short meetings, for instance. We talked about um, greening the campus and institutions responsibility in terms of climate change as well. And um, so those are just some of the things that the factors that we want to consider when we're moving forward. Um, rather than going back to the old normal, uh, you know, we've, we've got all this new learning and, and how we're going to how we're going to use it. Does anyone want to come in with something or would you prefer to um, sit on it and hold it till afterwards? 
at the end. Just uh, someone wave or shout if they want to come in. I think just keep us moving forward, Becky. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very, very much. It's incredibly rich and interesting um, mm -hmm. and lots of food for thought. So I think people will probably come back with points later. So um, I'm going to ask um, Vicky, uh, Victoria, sorry, um, if you want to present now, do you need to share screens and introduce yourself if you wouldn't mind? Hello, yeah, I'm happy to share my screen. Um, I did have some questions for, or some comments for Terry, Lisa and Jill, but I think really they'll there's some similarities with what I'm going to talk about and um, some of the things that have come up, which is kind of how we got um, involved in this in the first place when I had a chat with Jill. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll introduce some research that I've done. So my name is Vicky Mellon. I'm a senior lecturer in the um, tourism and hospitality subject group, which is within the Department of Service Sector Management in BTE. And um, I've done a bit of research with my colleague, Anna, who's no longer at SHU, uh, but we did a little bit of research around understanding commuter students and their motivations, their engagement and their learning experience. So um, thinking about why did we decide to research commuter students? Um, Anna had done a little bit of research in a kind of her teaching fellowship, but we could see from our cohorts and after being course leader for quite a few years, we could see the cohort changing gradually over time and that actually a number of students uh, were choosing to commute rather than become residential students. So I'm sure we all know, you know, students basically deciding they're going to stay at home with their families or their partners and not move into halls of residence. And we could see those numbers creeping up. And the other thing is that we could also see that those students appear to be having a different type of experience compared to um, residential students, if you like. We could see that they were engaging in different ways um, and it. And it was different for them and still is quite a different experience for them. So we wanted to explore, you know, what were the motivations? Why do students decide to commute rather than moving into Sheffield? Um, and how does this affect their engagement with their university life? So both their formal activities, the lectures and seminars and those curriculum activities, as well as those extra curriculum activities that, um, that we put on for them as well. So those were kind of some of the research questions that we had. So um, a very brief literature review that we did on sort of trying to investigate a bit more about the commuter student. Um, we found there wasn't a great deal of research in the UK. There were a few studies, but they were pretty limited, two or three. And most of the research out there about commuter students tended to focus in the US where um, up to 85% of students commute um, rather than going to you know, move away to college, that type of thing. So um, slightly different context for different reasons. So students going to community college, that type of thing. The other piece of research that we found from kind of reports um, and various statistics were that um, commuter students were mainly based at post-92 higher, ed higher education institutions. So I've got a list of, you know, West of Scotland and Sunderland, uh, approximately 70, 60, 70% 70 of their students, for example, are commuter students. And if we compare that to um, Oxford or Cambridge, who don't have any commuter students at all, and other red bricks like Bath and Durham and Exeter in York, they have less than 2% of commuter students. So um, it really is quite a different picture for those post 92 higher education institutions. Um, the other thing that we found in the kind of leading up to the research was that the commuter student population is actually quite diverse. It's not necessarily the traditional 18 to 22 year olds which stands to reason really, if you're you know, a mature student, perhaps you've got a family, you're not, you know, moving is not really gonna be an option for you. So it's quite a difficult population to pin down in terms of their characteristics. 
Um, all the research we found existing was that, you know, that these students will prioritise their academic activities over extracurricular activities, though they did often state their commitment to education. So um, we'll kind of see that our findings do align with that. Um, but that was quite prominent in the research that, you know, that there's this commitment to education there. However, um, you know, it was acknowledged in some of the studies that we looked at that there is a amongst the commuter students, perhaps the sense of belonging. And I think this ties in with a little bit about what Terry Lisa and Jill have talked about, you know, the fact that maybe they're not on campus in those different spaces doing other activities, extracurricular activities, and therefore they there is less of a sense of they feel less of a sense of community than they would do if that, you know, compared with the residential students, you know, the fact that they are not in halls of residence, um, they are not going out socially as much, they are missing out on those social interactions. Um, and also commuter students have, you know, this, the research, existing research was stressing that commuter students do have additional roles, you know, they may have um, caring responsibilities or um, you know, work commitments, and they have lots of other stressful things going on in their lives as well, like we all do to an extent, but this is perhaps it's a bit more in focus for these students. So there was, a, the research gaps really were particularly around qualitative research, there wasn't a lot of qualitative research with the perspectives of the commuter students, there were a couple of interesting ones where they were kind of focused on two or three students who wrote kind of journals which were really interesting um, but there wasn't a great deal there and uh, the research also showed that really you know there was just a lack of research particularly in the UK context um, around commuter students and in the context of our types of institutions really so you know, there is room for more exploration there. So we decided to do a very small scale study, I guess. Um, we conducted it at SHU, where we got the details that about 50% of our students remain at home at the moment. Um, we adopted a qualitative approach, so we engaged in semi-structured interviews with them. All the students were from the Department of Service Sector Management, and they happened to be um, tourism and events management students. We kind of just put notices up around the buildings. Um, they picked them up, um, but we, it was pretty easy to recruit. They were very happy to be interviewed, so that that was quite nice. Um, and all the students did identify as commuter students, which in itself is interesting because we didn't really give much of an indication of what that would be. But we just kind of said, if you live at home and if you, do you travel to university, you don't live in halls. They kind of responded so they self-identified as commuter students um very exploratory research, research i would say we were just kind of seeing what was out there but we did start this in 2000 uh, sorry 2020 um in february so we did meet half of them online and then very quickly um the other half went on to zoom um and it would have been perhaps nice to to explore but you know a bit more about what it was like for them being in COVID I think some of them perhaps felt a sense of this is what it's like for us more often kind of thing but it was so early on in the pandemic we didn't really know what was going on ourselves you know kind of at that time but we managed to do 14 interviews between us so we adopted some key themes to the research and the key to the interviews and the key themes that we kind of covered was we asked them to very much detail their commuter journey. How did they get there? Was it by public transport? Explained a, a bit about what that journey was like. Um, we talked to them about the student experience. We asked them about their engagement in academic and non-academic activities, their kind of extracurricular engagement. We asked them really what their motivations were for commuting. And then we just did a very simple kind of um, post-it note exercise where we left the room and we asked them to write on post-it notes, what would they like to see for commuter students? What were the recommendations? Would they, um, what would they ask? You know, if we could ask Callum anything, what would it be? That type of thing. 
And then we did the usual, we um, transcribed the material and then we analysed and coded and recoded and kind of both worked on different transcripts and swapped over. And so what I'm going to do now is just really show you some of those um, key findings. So why do students commute to university? Um, I don't think it's a huge surprise. Most of them um, had a sense that this was going to be a saving for them. Um, so there was a perceived and probably a real saving to not renting. Um, you know, they can save money um, despite transport costs, which does come up later on. But this was a means for them to maybe set themselves up for later. Fees were already expensive. So, you know, how can they keep this experience as low cost as possible, really? Uh, secondly, again, aligned with the literature, they did have other commitments such as work. Some students cited they had existing work commitments and quite significant ones, you know, working 20 to 30, 40 hours a week. They weren't really interested. You know, they didn't want to leave that job. They felt that was, a, you know, safe and, and they were glad to have that role. And they weren't prepared to leave those jobs, you know, and go through perhaps applying for a new position when they arrived in Sheffield. So they wanted to keep that. And also a couple of them were mature students as well. So clearly they had family commitments. So that was a good reason for them. Uh, this was a bit more that didn't really come up in the literature. Quite a lot of the students, um, a significant number of them, uh, I think it was actually six participants, revealed that uh, mental health and health reasons were a a significant reason for them choosing not to move um, into halls of residence or to student accommodation. In fact, they were concerned that by doing that, that would make their existing health problems uh, a lot worse. So, and that would partly be because they would be moving away from their social networks at home or their, their family support networks. So live for them, living at home was a was kind of a, a safety net for them. They didn't have to create new networks. They could continue to rely on them. And because they had existing mental health problems, that was really important to them. So I've put some quotes in um, here. You can just have a little look um, at these, but there was one really here in the top corner about cost. You know, I looked at staying, but it, you know, so they do, there is some consideration, but it's just expensive to live in halls and flats and perhaps, you know, cost of living, etc. And, you know, down at the bottom, they're a lot cheaper. You don't have to spend money. And, you know, this idea that you can save, you can save some money now, which you might need in the future. Um, but then we've got sort of a comment here regarding anxiety and mental health. So, you know, I had really bad anxiety, couldn't leave the house, um, et cetera. So, um, you know, but having a car gave that person some freedom. So, you know, that was kind of in there. But I decided that I wasn't ready to live in halls because I've had bad, bad anxiety. So those were the key kind of reasons that came up for um, for reasons for actually deciding to commute in the first place. Um, the next slide, the next kind of key finding really was we'd focused, we asked them to, about, you know, their engagement and how does commuting affect their engagement um, with academic activities in particular. So again, similar to the literature, all the participants confidently said, you know, I am absolutely committed to education they were keen to stress that just because they weren't living here it didn't mean that they weren't committed you know now I guess I am a lecturer so they are going to tell me you know I understand that my position there they might think um you know I better tell this person I'm really committed but you know they were emphasize their commitment to the studies um however clearly coming onto campus for one for a one hour lecture or maybe just two hours you know that's when they start to disengage and think you know what that's not worth my time or my money coming in um, and also if you think at this point certainly in our department uh, we were doing one our one-to-ones our academic advisors or tutorial sessions were very much on campus still 
And that was kind of perceived as, you know, why would I do that? That's a lot of effort for me to come in just for perhaps one of those activities. Um, Timetable gaps came up, um, not, a, not really an issue, but they did, you know, how do they, you know, that's something they navigate. That's kind of a barrier that they, or a constraint that they negotiate really, is that they do have these large gaps in timetables, um, you know, despite whatever guidance is out about timetabling, it's kind of inevitable. But most of them talked about how they would just go to the library, and work on assessments. One told me they joined a gym. Um, you know, they found they found ways to overcome that. Whereas they could see their peers, who were residential students, if you like, they were going home, nipping home for a couple of hours, going to get some lunch, then coming back. Or you know, they didn't really have that space to hang out, but they would maybe just use the library for those purposes. Um, group work was the other thing that came out as um, a challenge that they have to negotiate. Um, you know, they all talk quite a few. Well, I think yeah, most of we asked them about group work and it did come out as this is a challenge for us because um, we can't meet with students at 8 p.m. at night in the library like residential students can. Um, and this would cause frustration for everyone. And also sometimes they felt that other students didn't appreciate that they were commuting you know why can't you just meet me at this time it's like well actually I've got to come in specially to do this meeting um so that was cited as a challenge for them that they navigate and again some quotes um that were put in here so you know they do start with the you know I set out not to miss anything that's you know I'm not thinking as I start university what am I going to miss um you know they don't do that but at the same time, to see a lecturer for 10 minutes when I've had to pay £10 to come for 10 minutes, that's going to be a problem for them. And then uh, the, the quote about gaps, but also the group work thing is a, is a challenge for them. So talking about, you know, um, a situation where I've come in early, then someone didn't turn up, you know, that was frustrating to them. Or I did experience some members of the group getting annoyed and agitated if if she couldn't attend a meeting and feeling like that, that participant felt like she was an inconvenience to the other group because she couldn't just fall in line with those of the residential students. Um, some other issues that came up for commuter students. So a line, again, with in line with some of the literature that we read really is that they, all the participants had said they do not engage in extracurricular activities. And when we, just to outline the sort of things we were suggesting as extra, uh, extracurricular activities, it was things like social, you know, nights out, nothing to do with us organizing them as lecturers, but also anything kind of that we were putting on, maybe um, sometimes, for example, we would use the 12th floor because we're tourism and hospitality to have pizzas and, uh, you know, have a guest speaker in or something. They they weren't going to engage with that. They'd made a decision quite early on. Um, some of the students were saying things like, I knew that when I started university and that I was going to commute, therefore I knew I was going to miss out on those things. And they've made that they've reconciled in that in their head before they've even started university. Um, partly because it was very difficult to do. Where do you go on a night out? Where do you stay? Um, and, you know, if any, any activities that are held late afternoon, early evening are immediately problematic for commuting, not wanting to go home late, for example. So in turn, this, you know, contributes to their lack of um, sense of belonging, um, partly because they just really struggle to build those connections and those relationships and friendships when they're at university. So the lack of engagement with those, they all kind of accepted that it therefore was difficult to make friends and um, they felt quite isolated and that the term missing out did come up on several occasions you know they accepted they were missing out but this was you know something that they were prepared to do at the expense of getting a good degree 
you know, that was their main priority. And, you know, they were happy to take away those other elements, those extracurricular activities, even if those extracurricular activities might benefit their degree or benefit their employability. Some of them, I think, said, oh, maybe if it was an employability, you know, CV type activity, very practical. But most of them were like, no, you know, um, we're not going to engage with those. So they accepted that they weren't, it was, you know, they weren't, they're were almost like, we're not here to make friends. If you do, that's great. But we are here to get a good degree. That was the most important thing. Um, and also that commuting, you know, is still a cost to it. It's not a, a free option. So they all, they all um, were unhappy about the cost of commuting. Um, you know, public transport, unreliable, you know, that's quite stressful if you think you've got to get to a lecture at 9 a.m. and um, you're not going to get there because something's happened with your train. Um, cost of petrol, where to park, you know, then coming home late at night, you finish a lecture at six and um, you have something to eat. Do you, you know, you just kind of had enough, really. Um, you're not really at the point where you want to start doing some work. So they do have those added stresses that maybe uh, residential students don't necessarily have. And here are some of the quotes um, around missing out, you know, missing out on this full university experience. You know, they're missing out on things. Um, it's hard. You can't take part in clubs and societies. And you can't make additional friends while another participant added, I don't do much outside of the learning. Um, and some quite sad ones about feeling isolated, which is sort of ridiculous considering 50% of our students are commuters, that they should feel isolated when actually there's a lot more on their course, probably than they think are actually commuting. So, yeah, you know, it puts a lot of strain because you are doing academic work. I don't, you know, I've not made any friends, so I don't even speak to anybody about the coursework. So that's not great. And as kind of the quote, the, which we started with the title, it feels more like a job. It's not a bad thing. It's, you know, I, I don't do these hours and I, I do these hours and I go home again. So they really feel like they, they're coming into university. It's nine to five and then, then that's it. They're not getting that full university experience that that university ecosystem that actually we really promote at open days and campuses and campus tours accommodation tours um, you know we're not really thinking about the students I don't think and uh, that's quite sad and that is quite isolating for them so um, we've got some we came up you know the students gave lots of different recommendations and some were a bit unrealistic, you know, free parking and that type of thing. So we, we filtered out those and thought about what maybe we could be doing um, as an institution to support commuter students. So the first one is, you know, a more sensitive timetable, which I think would honestly benefit everyone, not just commuter students, members of staff, residential students, you know. Um, so this was a common recommendation, you know, avoiding large gaps, reduce teaching to a three day period and starting at 10 p.m. so they can avoid peak fares and perhaps reduced car parking. The three day a week thing, we did pilot that in the tourism subject group in 2019 with our final year students where we just had teaching Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. And it went down very well. Students liked it. It was good for us. It was good for me as course leader. I knew what I could plan on different days and I could plan those extracurricular activities and knew what we were doing. Um, and that looked like it was, you know, a success and it was going to go forward. And then we've had COVID and any sense of timetabling guidance has gone out the window. And I, I don't know if this is just me, but our timetabling is considerably worse than what it was pre-COVID. So um, I don't know why I don't understand, but yeah, it's all over the place now. So we something more sensitive timetabling would certainly help these students and probably others. Um, this commute, the students talked about 
um, you know, it would be nice to have a student voice for commuter students or a space even where they could go. Um, some noted it would be nice to have a commuter forum just where they could connect and make friends and also some representation from, from commuters. And I think, like I said, given 50% of them are commuters, it wouldn't be a minority group to have their views considered really. Um, so yeah, I can understand why they may think, you know, a commute, some kind of representation would be beneficial towards, would be beneficial, beneficial for them. Um, and similarly, they would like greater acknowledgement of their commuter status. Um, so many of them cited that it would be really nice if lecturers knew they were commuters, so they didn't have to continually do the email of, I'm at a train in Lincoln, it stopped, I'm not going to be there till 10 past nine. Um, I mean, it's difficult because we all want our students to be there on time and engaged, and it's disruptive when they, when they don't come um, on time. But, you know, these things do happen, don't they? And they would like that. And they would, someone mentioned, I think we've probably put it in our article, you know, when we have our student register, we have um, an asterisk for learning contracts. Could we have a C for commuter? So we knew, um, you know, what we're planning and when things were going to suit them, maybe. Um, which, you know, seems a reasonable, um, perhaps, recommendation. Um, and extra uh, extracurricular activities, a more inclusive approach to these. So, you know, organizing these around um, and between formal activities. Somewhat, there was a suggestion, a few suggested, could they do them online? But this was, again, pre-COVID. Pre and I, I wonder if um, actually they would have a different view if we said, oh, we're going to do online social events after doing a year, year and a half of online quizzes and social events. I don't think that's possibly <laughs> what they would really want. But, you know, something that's made me avoiding those late finishes. Um, but generally, it would be good if the institution could approach this rather than course leaders, i.e. myself, trying to think, oh, does this going to suit these people? You know, an institutional approach. Um, to develop in these activities and to really focus on how we're going to create a stronger sense of belonging among those commuter students. Um, it's just very hard because if they arrive and they've decided, sat down in induction, I'm not going to attend anything extra and I'm not hit. Great if I can make some friends, but I'm, that's not for me. That's not the life. Then, you know, they're already checking out of quite a lot of important activities. Um, but, you know, if we could get them early on, say, right, if you're a commuter student, here are the other commuter students, maybe you've got a bit more of a chance. I don't know. Um, so why is it, you know, why is it important to consider, you know, so the increase in tuition fees that originally came about, you know, will keep going and cost of living. I think probably it's a trend for our university and other post-92 institutions that will continue. Um, you know, withdrawal rates are higher within commuter students. Um, if they don't have that sense of belonging and it's easy for them to walk away. Um, so, you know, it could be good for this, uh, for reducing those withdrawals. Um, you know, engaging commuter students and trying to have more positive experience aligns with the university's um, obligations to become, you know, uh, sort of civic, their civic duty, uh, applied, widening participation. And, you know, I was sat in a research call yesterday for levelling up. Um, you know, it very much aligns to those kind of activities and those objectives. Um, and as course leaders, for me, it's inherently important that we create opportunities for enhancing engagement because, you know, putting on events where only half the cohort turn up is a bit depressing. So, so just try and increase that engagement would be, would be really good. Um, some limitations of the study, you know, they were mainly female participations. That does reflect the courses actually, um, that we probably interviewed, those students we interviewed. It was qualitative, it did provide some rich data, but it was quite small. And there certainly would be scope to do a bigger study with more institutions and perhaps quantitative and qualitative, comparative maybe. Um, yeah, so that's 
those are my limitations there and I've put the links into the paper and um, the references there as well so um, I'd happily welcome any comments or questions that people might have thank you so much Vicky it was, that was brilliant and I, I kept thinking about how it might apply to art and design where um, our culture of presence in studios is changing all the time and I'm mm. not always sure whether we've caught up with it Mm, mm. model of how our, our education should be and what it should look like based on what we had it's a bit yeah. like what is the culture the you know how do you build a culture of yeah for commuting students yeah it's difficult it's difficult to do I mean I've had commuter students who have moved who have decided halfway through I want to become a residential you know the commute's stressful or they've made friends that's been nice um but, and, you know, Terry Lisa's video she showed at the beginning, um, very shiny and nice. Um, but I do f feel like we're somehow missing out these students, you know. Um, I don't know how, or what, I don't know. I just feel like, you know, they think, that, I think even they come and they think university's not real. it's not really for them what's been advertised, university life. And they know it's not for them. Well, they don't think it's for them, but they're going to do the course anyway to try and get a good job. Yeah, I think I mean, that's that's what I'm mean, saying. You said at one point, you know, oh, you know, they want unrealistic things like free parking. Like, why is that unrealistic? Why could we not offer them free parking? That seems like the most, I mean, I know all sorts of reasons why that might be considered, you know, unsustainable yeah. un and unenvironmentally sustainable. <laughs> but actually, for these students, that would be, you know, just like we offer perks for freshers mm. or whatever, that would be a brilliant perk to offer and might yeah. make us distinct, actually. Mm. Yeah, I yeah, I think we're possibly missing a trick because if we're saying, you know, you're commuting and we really welcome you and, we, and this is if they used to do something, a commuter breakfast, that was the one thing they did in induction, but it was at eight o'clock in the morning, which if you're a commuter, you need to get up at set, you know, you need to get there even earlier and it's, you know, um, but it would be nice if we could, yeah, think about these students given the trend for them, I think, yeah. And it seems like an opportunity to think really imaginatively about what, a, mm. what kind of culture could you build around these yeah. important students? Mm. Um, how could they add to the university? How could they bring a, a different cultural flavour that would be mm. really important? Mm. and it, they these they do struggle more you know I don't think their degree doesn't their degree outcomes I don't think that struggles but they don't do there's a reluctance to do placement particularly so in my course tourism you know we've had a traditionally international placements but if you're a student who has already moved from a home to Sheffield you've already made one psychological jump to do that place so thinking about going to work in America for Disneyland is not that huge a thing but to the home students sorry to the commuter students if they've not they're still living at home they can't sometimes you can see their um you know they're thinking oh I could never do that that's not me you know I could never see myself working in Mallorca for a hotel chain or I could never see myself going to Germany to work in an airport you know whereas we're saying those are really doable things for you so um, again, that's to do with widening participation, that type of thing. But it's something that could be tackled, I think, more by the university. Yeah. Now, hold I can on see to some questions. I'm sorry. Was it, was, uh, I'm going to hand over to Julian, if that's okay, and hopefully have some time for questions at the end. Is that okay, Julian, to bring you in now? Please do use the chat because it's a really good record um, as we go along of thoughts that you have or questions. Great, um, thanks Becky, and um, thanks for inviting me. Um, so um, it's been quite interesting to, to hear about the kind of different ways in which the, um, the university is porous, you know, um, between you know, the digital and the physical worlds, between different places that people inhabit. Um, and to see that through the lens of the student experience, especially. So, um, what I'm going to do now is kind of switch to a different view, really, which is about the institution and the, 
the world it operates in and, and particularly on how the institution affects the place that it exists within. Um, so um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I work um, at CRAZER, Centre for Regional Economic and Social Research, and um, I'm going to be talking especially about the idea of the civic university, uh, which comes out of a piece of work that I and my colleague Ed Ferrari have been doing over the last couple of years. So um, hopefully um, you can now see my Green. Um, so yeah, that's right. fantastic. Okay. So yeah. So what what I want to do really is kind of open up a conversation about the effects that universities have on the places that they relate to. Um, so, um, as I said, it's been drawing on work that we've been doing with the Civic University Network, which is hosted at Hallam, but it's a national network of institutions uh, which are exploring how universities could become more civic, well, whatever that might mean. Um, and uh, as part of that work, Ed Ferrari and I have developed a prototype civic impact framework, which I'll explore and talk about a bit later. Uh, so to start with, um, I just want to explore a bit what we mean by civic and then take a look back to some historical and contemporary examples of the ways that universities have affected their places and uh, situating those in some contemporary concerns about the effects that universities have. Uh, then I'll introduce the framework and some of the questions that it raises about the, the different kinds of impacts that universities have on their places and uh, uh, some final thoughts about what a civic university could be. So um, the idea of the civic university has, um, has got quite a long history. Yeah, um, uh, it dates back to the, um, uh, you know, the so-called red brick universities um, set up at the turn of the 20th century in British industrial cities. Um, but before that, to the mid 19th century um, in the United States, where there was a series of what were called land grant universities, which were set up under the 1852 Morrill Act. And in both cases, the idea was that the university should exist for the betterment of the community by providing the kind of technical skills and knowledge uh, that were needed for, for, um, you know, for industry and, and in the case of the United States, particularly for agriculture. Um, and then more recently, there's been an upsurge of interest in universities' kind of civic missions, uh, particularly in the last 10 to 20 years. So again, starting um, very much in the United States with the work of the Anchor Institutions Task Force, uh, the idea that universities and hospitals are kind of anchors of their communities. They provide economic and social benefits, particularly in areas that are more deprived. Um, and then in the UK, that debate has been taken up um, as a kind of corollary, really, of the market-led reforms in higher education, which has really prompted a debate about what universities offer to wider society. Um, and then, you know, very much in the UK, that focus has been on economic development, on universities' role in supporting industry and jobs. So um, in one sense, not very much has changed in 100 years since the first civic universities were set up. Um, but there is another issue, which is referred to really in this quote and in these kind of examples in the, the slide of... Uh, you know, marketing from uh, different universities. And, and that is that the higher education sector is under pressure and it's, there are demands to justify the focus, particularly on you know, either on so-called ivory tower learning or on, what, or on what certain MPs talk about as Mickey Mouse courses. Uh, that kind of sense of justification that universities have actually got to show that they are uh, providing value for money and that has been kind of exacerbated really by the the newer sense that universities are kind of on the front line in culture wars that actually for the most part they'd rather avoid so you know as Bob Kerslake a former chief executive of Sheffield City Council before heading out the civil service wrote in the forward to the uh, Civic University Commission universities need all the friends they can get 
Um, and both in the UK and in the United States, this concern about the role of universities and their relation to places has uh, played out in comparable ways. And there's two real strands of debate that have opened up. One um, you could describe broadly as a kind of technical institutional agenda to recognize, celebrate, and improve the economic and social contributions that universities already make. Um, and that framing is at least in part one of justification for universities' existment, but uh, making the uh, argument that universities provide public value. So um, as John Goddard and Louise Kenton say in this uh, quote uh, here from 2016, yeah, uh, it's a mission of integration with the outside world and particularly with industry. Um, socioeconomic impact designed in from the start, strong community involvement in teaching, long-term objective of widening participation. So it's universities um, you know, serving public policy goals. Um, there is another strand to the debate, which um, yeah, until more recently has been a lot stronger in the United States. Um, and that's um, much stronger on social critique and it recognizes that universities' impacts on places have not always been beneficial. Uh, and in this view, uh, universities need to rediscover their democratizing role. It's not just about widening participation, but it's about critiquing the basis on which people and communities participate in society. Um, so within the more recent literature on civic universities, uh, that question has been framed in terms of universities being for a place as well as of or in it. Um, but that preposition for opens up, or it ought to open up in my view, a world of debate about which interest groups are served. So historically, it's worth recalling that universities have, um, have always have occupied a privileged but not always comfortable position in the interface between the kind of secular, religious and civic worlds. Yeah, um, the original universities um, served the interest of the local and national state. They supplied skilled workers for bureaucracies in the church or in law. Uh, and they brought prestige and funding to their host cities. Um, and often that prestige was international. So this is, I think, the earliest picture of uh, international students enrolling that I've discovered uh, at the University of Bologna in 1497. Um, and um, again, an example from the 15th century about that in interface between uh, universities and society quoted by the historian Lawrence Brockris um, about the city of Le the University of Leuven in Belgium, uh, which spent a fortune on messengers, gifts, dinners, bribes and ambassadors to get influential people to favour the idea of founding a new university and to be able to complete the business quickly. Nothing was less to chance. The city provided necessary buildings, including a prison. Uh, so you know, that, that would be interesting in the light of uh, Jill and Terry Lee's uh, um, research into working environments and, uh, and, and exactly what the student experience might have been at Leuven in the uh, 15th and 16th centuries. Um, and interestingly, the city paid the professors uh, which, um, which again, you know, in recent history, uh, when Sheffield Hallam was a uh, city of Sheffield Polytechnic, um, you know, local government pay and conditions applied to the teaching and academic staff. So, um, so some of these things go back a very long way. Um, but, but you have this um, entwining of the university and the city, uh, each having uh, mutual benefits, um, but but also having a university being 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 a kind of um, civic bauble for the uh, for the locality. You know, if you had a university, uh, even though it might cost you, it, it gave you a kind of sense of of, of being better than the rest. Um, but uh, it's not always a cosy relationship. Um, you know, universities as party towns, um, famous incident from 1355, um, where, where the parties got out of hand and, and of course it was all about the quality of booze at the local pub. Uh, 
so since Scholastica's day in Oxford, um, 63 students ended up being killed as a result of various disturbances. And, um, uh, and famously, Oxford was uh, placed under a papal interdict, which meant that um, no religious services could be held there for two years. Um, what the students thought of that was uh, not, re not uh, recorded, unfortunately, in any of the accounts, but uh, they, may, they may have welcomed this break. Um, but um, more recently, this, this kind of tension between you know, universities and places has continued. So some examples from the United States in the 1970s, um, the Deer Park riot at the University of Delaware in 1974, when 4,000 students turned out to watch 100 streakers. Um, yeah, um, an example of the kind of extracurricular activity that uh, uh, commuting students might well be pleased not to have to take part in. Um, uh, but yeah, trash, yeah, usual kind of um, uh, relationships between the university, the students and the police. And um, the picture's not very good, but you can see on the slides, these kind of uh, police heavies standing guard in the bottom picture um, at the entrance to the campus to prevent the students getting back out into the town. Um, and um, yeah, more recently, uh, this is Belfast in uh, 2016. Um, the, there's a neighborhood of South Belfast near Queen's University, which is known uh, peculiarly as, as the Holy Lands. Um, and it's the scene for the St. Patrick's Day parades. And um, you know, every year, uh, the, you know, this results in kind of drunken behavior. And um, uh, you know, police describing students as irresponsible and lacking any sense of moral or social responsibility. So, um, I mean, the point of kind of going through these is that, is that actually the perceptions of the university within the place are not always positive. And often it's the people who are least well off and more disadvantaged within the place who actually feel the more negative impacts of the university's existence there. So, um, you only have to look at local newspapers at the end of every summer term to see how um, the university's place-based impacts are perceived and narrativized. Uh, so piles of rubbish in Liverpool, uh, disgusting waste in Nottingham, rubbish spilling onto the streets in Loughborough, filthy scenes in Cardiff, uh, up to the point where in the final headline, uh, it's it's not just um, uh, the rubbish that attracts rats, but it's the students who are being described by local people as vermin. Um, and what's interesting is that acknowledgement of these effects on places is uh, strangely absent from a lot of the civic university material and civic university agreements that um, universities are putting together. Um, so it's just worth stopping with this issue for a moment because it, you know, it isn't just about local newspaper sensationalism or standard student rowdiness. Um, yeah, there is a trend that's taking place in terms of the if, impact on housing markets, which is known as studentification, horrible term, but it covers some important neighbourhood dynamics. So where the presence of the university is seen as actively contributing to a lower quality of life within that place. Uh, so the quote on the slide is from a study in West Virginia, a town called Morgantown, uh, where they did um, qualitative interviews with local residents. And um, one of them quoted here was actually a university employee and saying, you know, the biggest problem in this neighborhood of town is the university. And it was, uh, you know, and for this person, uh, the issue was seen as the university not actually caring about the quality of life associated with the students uh, and the quality of life enjoyed by the students as well. Um, you know, so, so the kind of um, antisocial behaviour was seen as a direct result of universities actually not investing in the student experience. Um, but 
it's not just the private rented sector which is an issue. So it also affects the design and development of the built environment more generally. And in the UK, uh, there's now a proliferation of purpose-built student accommodation in you know, large blocks of service flats, little or no exterior space. So if you look around Sheffield, uh, the St Vincent's area near the University of Sheffield, city centre around Devonshire Street, uh, De Devonshire Green, Division Street, full of student accommodation built by speculative developers with little care for the wider effects on place, either in terms of design or occupancy. Um, and while that accommodation may be provided by the private sector, universities need to acknowledge their own role in this place shaping. Uh, so in the UK now, 30% of full-time first-year undergraduates live in per private purpose-built student accommodation. Um, and the you know 4.9 billion pounds of investment in this sector in 2020. Um, average size of blocks coming onto the market now is 400 beds, so the big lumps of building, um, and and they represent a kind of form of urban densification that is unplanned and unscrutinized. Um, Recently, Saddles, the estate agent, talked about a wall of money targeting the student housing sector. Uh, most recent major investment uh, reported by the FT was by the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Singapore. So basically, you know, this is not about student experience. This is about uh, big commercial entities making a lot of money out of real estate speculation. Um, and, and there seems to be a detachment, really, uh, in terms of the involvement of university authorities in, in this, this placemaking that is going on yeah, uh, outside, you know, uh, in front of our noses, really. Uh, and, and as um, you know, Sage, Smith and Hubbard's you know, study in 2013 thought, you know, there are actually displacement effects on existing populations. So, um, what can we do to think about how universities can become more civic? So when we think about civic activity, um, a part of the issue, I think, is how to mitigate and reverse the negative effects of universities, as well as quite rightly celebrating and working to improve the positives. So over the couple of years, last couple of years, uh, we've been scoping out how to measure or assess the impacts that universities have in ways that could generate meaningful change. Um, so we've developed through workshopping with other institutions and, and, and through literature review, um, a prototype framework for civic impact. Um, and it was clear when we were talking to uh, universities, they didn't want you know, yet another league table. Uh, where institutions kind of compete for brownie points. Um, rather, they wanted a tool that would help them to ask the right questions about what they're doing within the places where they work. So to um, challenge universities to think broadly about places and to improve what they do, we identified in the inner circle of the diagram seven domains of activity that comprise civicness. So... I'd argue a university that's not engaged in thinking about civic impacts of all of these activities should probably not claim to be civic. Um, and within all of them, we'd expect universities to consider their core business of teaching and research. So we don't see staff or students as separate domains. They, you know, that, uh, those activities would exist you know, across the piece. Um, some of those domains are familiar territory within the kind of civic university literature, leadership, um, economic impact, social impact. Um, the others um, have been backgrounded to some extent in the past, and, and we felt that they should be brought more to the fore, particularly the environmental domain, which has been very much absent from a lot of the civic university discourse, um, surprisingly considering the environmental impacts of universities themselves and their central role in generating knowledge about climate and biodiversity um, and their impact in shaping the views of and behaviours of their students. 
Uh, health and well-being uh, has very much come to the fore through COVID-19, but um, you know, universities have a crucial role not only in training the healthcare workforce of the future, but also in in um, in, in actually um, you know, creating healthy uh, approaches to life among their staff and students. Um, and then uh, cultural activities and university facilities, the campus itself and, and its wider impacts on place. Um, so what's it for? It's not just about how to categorize universities' impacts on places, it's about the processes of change and improvement that uh, need to take place. So um, just going back uh, to the previous slide, on the, the outer circle, you'll see uh, you know, a six stage process of uh, what, um, reviewing civic activity, um, mapping where we are now, partnering, who should we work with, uh, agreeing what we're going to do and who do we agree that with, resourcing, how do we actually pay for it, um, who's going to work on it, evaluating what's working well, what should we change and, and learning. Um, so having identified those um, domains and processes, we need to consider what kind of indicators of success or impact are appropriate. And in our discussions, you know, some, some colleagues were saying we need clear quantitative metrics and we resisted that for two reasons. First, because they can be reductive, they boil complexity and variety down to, you know, killer questions, which uh, turn out not to be the right questions in the end. And secondly, because they encourage target hitting rather than deep reflection, which is what we hope this is going to be about. Um, so within each domain, we pose a series of questions that encourage universities to develop locally appropriate indicators and agree those with key partners. And I'm just going to run very quickly through, through the way that we've uh, framed some of those questions. And it's very much, you yeah, know, this is an initial framing, which is up for testing and discussion and further work within each locality. Um, so it's basically a kind of startup for 10. Uh, but looking at the social domain, yeah. Uh, how do we want our university to bridge and reduce social divides and improve quality of life in our communities, including the most disadvantaged communities? How can our university help our places move from functioning to flourishing? So it is very much about inequality and how do we tackle that and not just about how do we, you know, uh, how do we contribute to the, the kind of overall social well-being of a place? Um, so uh, the environmental domain, um, you know, how can our university play a leading role in mitigating and adapting to climate change, reducing biodiversity loss, educating students for sustainability? How will it influence environmental behaviours throughout our city or region? And it's good to see you know, that there is more work going on in this field than used to be the case. but. But, you know, frankly, there's a, a very, very long way to go. Um, culture, you know, um, not just what are universities contributing to the culture of their communities, but how are they uh, celebrating and amplifying the culture that already exists within their communities and the diversity of those cultures and their expressions. So, you know, how do we enrich the cultural life of our localities? How to create vibrant, creative, playful places. Um, obviously, there's the economic domain. Um, we need to ask, how can our universities work create more prosperous places? Uh, how can it address and reduce economic inequality? Uh, so it's the leveling up agenda, but it's a lot more than that. It's about, you know, can we articulate and promote a coherent vision of a flourishing local economy? It's not just about how many spin-outs are we investing in? Um, place and facilities. Um, how can our facilities, how can our campus be used for the whole community? Who's welcome there? Um, how do we set a standard for placemaking and sustainability where we are? And how can our digital infrastructure benefit our communities, not just our um, teaching staff and students? 
health and well-being yeah are, are we supporting the health and well-being of our localities as well as our own staff and students what does a flourishing community look like and then leadership uh, and this is not just about the vice chancellor um you know making the right statements although have the vice chancellor making the right statements is it really important but it's how deeply embedded is that in the leadership of the university how will top level governance and strategies reflect our civic commitment which partners are we working with you know are we just talking to the chief execs of uh, nhs trusts and local authorities or are we going deeper than that what would it look like if our civic priorities are actually embedded throughout our core activities so as we address those sort of questions we need to learn from others about collaborative multi-dimensional approaches to placemaking and recognize that universities don't have a monopoly of wisdom here uh, yeah they should be here to learn from practice that exists within their communities uh, so I've just uh, referred here to the place standard tool which is you know it, it, another way of thinking about impacts on place and it's used extensively in Scotland it's not perfect by any means but it you know um, looking at the kind of 14 domains of place within that tool and I've put a web link in the um, in the slide uh, you know that that gives us a different way of thinking about what is it that we should be considering when we think about our effects on places. Um, and finally, I think it, you know, we need to see the civic agenda as an opportunity to open up the conversation, to break down institutional barriers. And you know, historically, some of the most exciting contributions universities have made have been when staff and students broke out of their hierarchies and worked together on common issues. So this is an example of an environmental teaching at the University of Michigan in the 1970s. Um, more recently, and um, I know Julie's here and uh, has, uh, you know, could tell you a lot more about this, but just as an example, Sheffield Arc, uh, fantastic collaboration between Harlem and community organisations in Sheffield to start really constructive conversations about climate change and, you know, what does it mean for our city and the communities within it? Uh, and these things are often under the radar, and I think the Civic University agenda creates an opportunity to amplify that and to give staff uh, and students permission actually to raise their voices and to 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 do more and more do more creatively with with people and communities within their places but they need more institutional clout behind them and that needs to be valued and recognized and and finally the civic agenda should offer a place for reimagination including you know what are actually what are we doing here as a university um, how are we valuing the people who work and learn within its walls and what kind of cities and towns do we want to inhabit in the future and that's not an easy ask because institutions by their nature are geared to sustaining rather than questioning their own values uh, so I hope the civic university agenda if taken seriously might actually encourage institutions to become more adventurous in how they see themselves and how they see their contribution to society so I'm going to stop sharing now and um, hopefully there is time for uh, a little bit of discussion and comments, questions. Thank you so much, Julian. That was, that was brilliant. Um, three really, really um, fantastic presentations together. Um, we, have, we haven't got a great deal of time, but it would be great to hear um, a few questions to any one of the speakers. I'll, I'll dive in if I may, um, Becky. Uh, this is a question for Terry Lisa and uh, Jill in terms of the um, hurriedly formed norms of the uh, COVID online world. Um, I'm thinking particularly about Generation COVID, the, um, the, the, the level four students who moved sort of uh, straight from uh, uh, sort of uh, A-level studies or BTEC into, into the online realm, not stopping at uh, um, uh, the go point of, you know, Freshers' Fair and all that physical engagement with campus. Um, to what extent do we think that that normative sort of reformulation is, is, can only move in one direction? 
what what is being carried forward from that online forging into the supposedly back on physical campus uh, realm you know are, 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 is generation covid irrevocably different in the terms of way in which it is sort of semi detached to the physical sense of campus and other norms that were formed in a rather sort of distorted way during that first year of online experience does your does your research sort of show anything of what happens now that we're trying to get back onto campus for that particular cohort yeah, that's a really good question uh, and one that is in evidence in the research that we did. So everything, all of our data collection took place during uh, the sort of the year, the pandemic year. Um, I'm, I'm hoping it's going to catch on. Uh, so we couldn't necessarily comment on that, but we were actually reflecting more anecdotally about uh, those students who did have that experience that you mentioned, uh, because like lots of other courses, we have been experiencing really low numbers in terms of engagement on campus uh, in lots of different areas um, and um, we wonder what some of the reasons around that might be uh, and I get a sense from speaking to students that for some it's about making up for lost time like not having that student experience uh, that was perhaps encapsulated in Julian's photograph of uh, South Belfast there uh, they kind of want to enjoy themselves uh, which I can't really begrudge them for that to be honest. They want to enjoy themselves and they've also got the comfort blanket of everything being recorded and persuading themselves that they'll watch it later. Arguably, yes, but it's really interesting because one thing that I thought about with when Vicky was delivering her talk about commuter students is sometimes I do think that we're guilty of having a really narrow idea about what an engaged student looks like. You know, if a student's not there, then you think that they're not engaged. But actually, as Vicky's research showed, you know, that person can be making a huge amount of effort just to get to campus and not quite managing it. And um, so I think we can adapt, hopefully, um, and think about how we might get our students to engage in different ways. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a supplemental that follows in hot pursuit and, and, and now directs a question to, to Vicky? Um, certainly in my experience, commuting students when COVID hit, seem to be quite pleased that there were now mm. all the opportunities to not have to travel um, and to learn asynchronously, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and again, I wonder whether there's a sort of a follow through in relation to that or whether any of that was evidenced in, in, in your research. I know that it was done very much at the start of, mm. of the, the COVID year. Yeah, um, uh, it wasn't evidenced in the sense that we wrote it up, but there definitely was a bit there, um, you know, they were very happy to be online yeah certainly and they were happy to sit there and you know this suited them much more you know nine o'clock lectures on a Monday morning with me they were you know there ready to go mm -hmm. um so I you know and that was floated I think in the earlier interviews you know why can't we have some of these recorded sessions I mean they got their wish sort of twofold you know afterwards you know why can't we have some because at that point we weren't really recording lectures we were recording you know pre-pandemic recording screencasts about assignment briefs well, why can't we just record lectures and put them up there for for commuter students so yeah it, it was coming out that they were happy with this and there were some you know and clearly I mean, I don't know if this is university wide, but academic advisor meetings, one to ones with postgraduate students, all of those in our department are still online. And I think that's they'll continue with that. And clearly that's better than me going into work, quite frankly, in the middle of the summer to do a one to one with a postgraduate student and them coming into the campus to do that. So I do think they felt a bit more. Um, having a similar experience to everyone else that they'd not had previously. I do think there was a sense of that, yeah. Thank you. Um, Julian, can I ask about sort of risk? So those, um, you know, to, to take those different domains, so the social domain and bridging and reducing social inequality um, obviously it's the kind of aim everyone would stand by but it's so full of conflict about about who whose needs and uh, in addressing 
one community's or thinking about one community's needs, it can connect detrimentally on other communities' needs. And I, I just wonder how, how, how prepared universities are for risk and conflict that comes from this stuff because they seem so risk averse and all this stuff sounds full of really great interest in risk. Yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, I think the answer is probably not not very much. Um, and you know, part part of it is that universities are actually not as good as working in partnership um, as they often think they are. Um, so you know, you, the only way to resolve the, that the kind of conflicts and tensions that you talk about is actually through um through dialogue and consensus building uh, and that needs to go a lot deeper than high level engagement at sort of chief exec to chief exec level um so um yeah i mean as examples of how to kind of work in this space i'd point to things like the sheffield fairness commission um, yeah, which was uh, instituted by Sheffield City Council, not by either of the universities, but uh, the universities played some role in that. Uh, but more importantly, the Commission uh, has a process of dialogue with communities in Sheffield, which is about, you know, what does fairness look like for the city uh, and for different groups within the city? And, and, and yeah, uh, I think we need to avoid it being seen as a kind of zero sum game where by working for the benefit of one community, that's seen as um, problematic or, or a loss to another community. Yeah, uh, it, it's actually not the case. And, and, and yeah, and I think universities, because of you know, the, the kind of multifaceted way that they engage with place actually are in quite a good place to be in that conversation. I think what they need is sufficient humility to, to say we are not leading that conversation, we're joining it. Uh, could I just add something there, sorry, from, <clears throat> from my own research, because my ongoing PhD is about this exact area. Please don't ask me any more questions about it. Um, but the whole Barnet Ecological University model um, is kind of predicated on this notion that the university has expertise which it can offer, but it must do that from a listening position. He says very much, and this came out from the interviews I did with, with people as well, that the university shouldn't go to communities to say, oh, I see you have a problem. Well, we have an answer, here it is. But they go to the communities and say, well, we've identified what we think might be issues in your areas and how we might help. But then you listen back to say, well, actually, the problems are X, Y, and Z. And then there is this dialogue um, whereby the university then enables its expertise to be used by meaningfully by the community. And, and a couple of respondents used that anchor idea that I think Julie mentioned. And one talked about the university as, a, as an honest broker. Uh, I'm much more sanguine about universities having lived and worked in them for a very long time. Um, but there was this notion that the university can present itself as, a, to slightly misuse a, a term of art, as a third space. Yeah. You know, we're not the council. Yeah. And we're not the community. We're somewhere that you can come to as a space, even if we just facilitate dialogue. Yeah, yeah that, that's really... The academic thing, yeah. and you go away and use the, the knowledge we, we produce. Um, and Barnett also, because he's using Heidegger, the Nazi, sorry, I have to say that, it's a tick I have. Um, he taught, he uses that University 4 notion, that mm. ontological idea that the university exists not merely in its community, passively, or even of its community actively, but for, you know, responding uh, to it. Uh, so that's the kind of theoretical base for it, which is sometimes ironically missing in a lot of university engagement work. Yeah. Is a theoretical kind of reflective base for it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. I'd be really interested in having a further chat about uh, the work that you're doing. Um, but yeah, spot on.
Can I throw in a question that sort of sort of follows on from that? Um, uh, they say never ask a question you don't know the answer to, and I don't know the answer to this, but I know that not every single university in the UK is a member of the Civic Universities Network. That sort of implies that there might be some universities that are ambivalent or negative to the idea of being civic universities. Are there any that are actively negative out there, or is it just a case of ambivalence on the part of those who aren't declaring themselves to be civic? Um, I wouldn't say that we've encountered hostility. Um, I mean, I think there are universities that would say that the civic agenda isn't for them. Uh, and actually, yeah, I mean, I think that's fair enough in a way that, that if, you know, if, if your conclusion is that what you are is an international research based university that is not about your place, um, let's be upfront about that. Um, but then let's not pretend that you're something other. Yeah. Thank you. I think there's also my impression of the Civic University Network because it makes it clear that it is about an active commitment to a set of principles and it, it doesn't say we're the only way to be an engaged university. Because an international research university, not mentioning any people who might be near to us, um, can still be engaged. I mean, Sheffield University is a civic university, but your Oxfords, Cambridges and so on could also be civic, but just with a different conception of what that means, a more global kind of a position, uh, taking their community at a very wide level. And certainly one of the conclusions of my research is that that's fine, that there are different authentic ways to be uh, civic, and it doesn't have to be programmatic or, or formalised. Can I say something? I I don't even know how to say this without sounding like I'm completely speaking against my, my own interests, but, um, and I'm not in any way disregarding any work that happens in this area, but so I worry about the ways the arts are deployed to, cap, to, to deal with these sorts of agendas, because it's really the arts, generate images even though they are social experiences and they become really high capital to show look we engage some people and it costs like 20p in relation to you know university budgets and as much as I am completely convinced of the ways that art the arts and culture engage with real social experience and enhance it I worry about universities using it because it's very cheap and it makes them those images are so easily used. And I, I kind of think it worries me that the university will fund a whole load of art projects that cost, you know, that they're gonna spend 50 grand on, whereas actually genuinely building, for example, building some spaces that the community that are given to the community is a hell of a lot more expensive and, and controversial. And I, 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 as much as I, you know, I make work in this area, I worry about the, the dynamic of how the arts gets caught up in this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think all civic engagement is going to, uh, it's going to involve negotiating tensions and, and, and some of these problematics. Now, that, um, but I, I totally hear what you're saying on, yeah, the, what, you know, it's what, what has been kind of um, labelled civic washing. Right, yeah, there's the, the sort of equivalent of greenwashing by, by, by universities. And, and you know, it's, as, as you say, it's really easy to kind of talk the talk and then um, not resource it. So, yeah, I mean, the kind of question that I would start to ask is how are universities actually supporting uh, and helping to sustain for the long term the cultural life of their communities uh, rather, rather than what are we doing to engage, which always comes across as that kind of uh, slightly paternalistic, um, you know, uh, we are the benefactors approach. And, and we've, you know, we've really got to grow out of that. Anyone else? I apologise for letting us run over slightly, but I just thought there was so much interesting there. Um, I think unless anyone does have anything, 
really burning. Um, I think we probably should wrap up for the sake of people's evenings and my very cross daughter, who I told to shut up. Um, um, and, but thank you, everybody. It was completely um, uh, captivating and so interesting. Um, so thank you for a brilliant afternoon. Thank you, Luke, for organising so well. And um, also for archiving these so well, Luke, they're, they are a really brilliant resource. Uh, so hopefully um, conversation can continue in lots of different ways. So thank you yeah. all very much. The recording will be uploaded uh, tomorrow evening. Um, and uh, yeah, it will sit there alongside all of the others for uh, anyone's uh, future future reference. So thank you. Thank you one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye -bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. bye.